This is Dr. Yolanda Jones, your instructor for CH301, which is Chemistry in Life. This is going to be a lecture-based series where I'll deliver some um, content from the book featured here. This book is not required for the course, but I wanted to let you know where the course content is coming from. It's listed in your syllabus. If you would like to rent it or purchase it um, using Course Smart or via Amazon Kindle or some other um, service, um, please feel free to do that. I plan to cover the content in a way that kind of serves as a review for folks who've had chemistry before and that shows it's the application and connectivity of chemistry with life applications and life processes. So we're going to do about, I plan to do eight units. Um, we may not make it to eight, more probably we'll make it between six, seven or eight units. And we're going to do it in an independent study style where I'm going to deliver a lecture to you um, via YouTube and then give you some um, assigned problems to work on um, based on that lecture material. I encourage everyone who is having difficulty with the content or any problem or question, I have office hours and they're posted on the syllabus and I strongly encourage you to call, email, or stop by during my office hours so that we can um, work out any difficulties that you may be experiencing. This course is also designed um, for this semester to assist folks who are taking um, standardized exams who may need some sort of general chemistry, organic chemistry, and biochemistry review. So it doesn't go into great detail in all of the areas of chemistry. It more serves as a um, an overview or a survey to remind us of all of the skills, the basic skills, and then show their application to life. Um, this course is especially useful for um, healthcare professionals, um, people who are interested in attending or are going to nursing school or any other health or allied um, profession. So let's get started. Um, I'm labeling this on the slide as chapter one, but since we're not necessarily using, since you don't necessarily have a book, we're going to call it chapter or unit one. And so basically what this is, is um, the basics of chemistry, just the very, very basics. So we all know that everything in life is chemistry. Everything in life is connected to chemistry in every way, from the air we breathe to the beds that we get out of when we wake up in the morning, to the water we drink, to the water, um, <clears throat> the soap we use to uh, to take a shower in the morning, to so the automobiles that we drive, the gas that we consume, the roads that we drive on. Everything is chemistry. So basically what this chapter is going to do is to give us a way to define what's called matter. That everything that is chemistry is matter. Matter is all of the stuff around us. It's defined as anything that has mass and occupies space. So what we want to do in this first unit is identify matter Review how to measure matter. And um, the changes, processes, and reactions that matter can undergo. So this next slide is just basically an outline of the unit. We're going to first talk about how matter is classified. We're going to look at um, the differentiation between elements and compounds and mixtures and things of that sort. We're going to review the periodic table. We're going to look at how um, we 
use our basic math skills to count and quantify matter. And then we're going to um, look at how matter is assembled and look at um, some of the most common units that are used to define matter in the healthcare profession or as it relates to um, life in the human body. And then we're going to look at the basics of some of the changes um, that matter can undergo. Okay, so the first thing that um, we want to do is look at the classifications of matter. And like I say, this is a very, very informal style lecture delivery that I have. And so I may pause, uh, I may say um a lot, but hopefully you'll be able to get my style eventually or soon rather than later. So we start out knowing that matter is everything in the universe. Matter is basically classified in two broad classifications. And that is pure substances and mixtures. So a pure substance is something that is made up of only one constituent throughout its entire composition. A mixture, on the other hand, is something that has two or more constituents or components. First, looking at mixtures, there's some text in the next couple of slides and in your handouts. And I neglected to mention, um, you do, you should um, go to Blackboard and print out the handouts that accompany this lecture or this presentation because you'll be able to take notes on it as I'm talking through the lecture. So I've posted the lecture to black the notes to Blackboard in two different ways. You have it as um, PowerPoint handouts where there's two slides per page and you also have it as the um, the the generic the notes page for PowerPoint that has one slide per page and a large area at the bottom where you can write notes. But our text definition here tells us that a mixture is a combination of two or more substance and it can be separated. And then within a mixture we have two different types of mixtures. We can have a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. A homogeneous mixture is one that is uniform throughout. We cannot look at the mixture and tell that it's some that it's two or more substances mixed together. Heterogeneous mixture is obvious when we look at it that it's not uniform and it varies throughout. So that's what we call a heterogeneous mixture. So looking at the examples on the graphic. Um, So the example that they gave us in the book is that of for a heterogeneous and homogeneous mixture. For homogeneous mixture, they gave us an example of brass, which is an alloy of copper and zinc. When you actually look at this brass trumpet, you cannot distinguish two separate components. It looks like one uniform substance. Same would be if we have um, a salt water solution, you know, the saline solution we use in our contact lenses, where we would have salt that's dissolved in water. Well, after that salt actually dissolves, then it's uniform throughout, and you cannot tell by looking at it that it is a mixture. They gave us a pretty obvious example here of water and copper. If you just have um, a big chunk of metal that you stick in water, of course you can easily distinguish by looking at that, um, that glass of water that you've got two separate components in there. Um, the same thing is um, sand and water. We put sand and water just like we did with salt. You know, the salt dissolves, but the sand would not. So we would have a heterogeneous mixture with the sand in the water because we wouldn't be able to 
but because we are obviously able to distinguish the sand from the water. Concrete is another good example of a heterogeneous mixture because you've got your sand, you've got your cement, and you've got your rock. And those are very distinguishable, although when you mix them together, they're solid. Those are distinguishable components um, that are different from each other. The And that is examples of the mixtures. So the next category or the other category is pure substances. Pure substances are classified as either elements or compounds. Now looking here, an element is the simplest type of matter. It's made up of only one type of atom. And what an atom is, is the tiniest unit of matter that can't be divided any further that keeps its unique characteristics. So each element has its own characteristic properties. Its atoms have their own characteristic properties. An atom of chlorine is different than an atom of gold, and which is different than an atom of hydrogen, etc., etc. So an element is the simplest type of matter, I'm going back up, that only consists of one type of, of atom. On the other hand, a compound can consist of more than one type of atom or more than one atom that is <clears throat> chemically joined together. Or should I say um, atoms that are chemically joined together. Okay, an example down here is copper, which is element. Copper, when you take a sample of copper, there's only one type of, of atom that you're going to find in that sample. It's only going to be copper atoms. On the other hand, a compound has different types of atoms joined together. So for water, we've got hydrogen atoms that are bonded to an oxygen atom to make each individual compound or molecule of water. So if it's a pure substance, it could be an element or compound. An element only has one type of atom, and a compound has more than one type of atom that are chemically joined together. Okay. And these are notes that um, just say what I just said. All right. Once again, says what I just said. Okay. So Elements are actually listed individually. Each, each pure substance that is an element has a block on what's called the periodic table. We have the periodic table where each block represents one element. And it gives us a lot of different information about the characteristics of that element and some of its tendencies and, prop and properties. So looking at the periodic table, um, we can see that it is arranged in a very distinct way. And we're going to come back to that in just a second.
first, before we get to the periodic table, I want to um, look at a couple of examples that ask us to determine the difference between um, whether or not the following are homogeneous or heterogeneous, heterogeneous mixtures. This is basically a problem that, or an example that kind of wraps up what we just talked about. So the first one is a can of soda. The second one is a These are almost too obvious, aren't they? So, of course, the one that's homogeneous is the can of soda because we can't look at it and identify its composition or that it has more than one um, component. And the one that's heterogeneous is the heterogeneous, because it has obviously has more than one component when you when you look at the two. Okay. So the next question is to classify each of the following as a element or a pure substance. In a recorded lecture, is if um, you want to skip past this, if you think you fully comprehend this, go right ahead and skip over this. Okay. Okay, so classify the following as an element or a pure substance. Well, the way that we would do that is if it's located on the periodic table, it's an element. So helium is located on the periodic table. When you look at the periodic table, I'm sorry, this question was supposed to be, please, 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 forgive me. This is supposed to be element or a compound. Okay, so if you look on the periodic table and you see the, the symbol or if you see the substance, then you'll know, okay, it is a element. If you do not see the substance listed on the periodic table, then it is a compound. Helium is has only one type of atom. Carbon dioxide has both carbon and oxygen, 
and purified water has hydrogen and oxygen. And we're going to look much more carefully at um, how compounds form and all that good stuff as we go through. Okay, so back to the periodic table. Once again, all elements are listed individually on the periodic table of the elements. Going across a row, or going across on the periodic table, we call these rows or periods. Going up or down on the periodic table, we call these groups or family. And the periodic table is separated into two sides. The left side, which are the elements that are shaded in blue here, represent elements that are metals. So everything to the left of this little stair step line that's in blue is what we call a metal. Everything that's to the right of the stair step line is a non metal. And everything that actually sits against the stair step line, either on the right or the left, we call a semi metal or a metalloid. And these elements have properties that are hybrids or that have um, a little bit of metallic character and a little bit of non-metallic character. So they have properties that are between those of the metal and the non-metal. So when we actually write a chemical formula for a compound, what we do is we show the number and the type of each element that's present in the compound. So we are accustomed to seeing um, H2O, which is water. And so that tells us that the chemical formula for water tells us that we have two hydrogens present and one oxygen. The fact that there's no subscript on the oxygen means that there's one present. So when we write a chemical compound formula, we write the identity of the element followed by a subscript that tells us how many atoms of that element that we have present in each mole of compound. Or how many moles of that? We'll get into that later. Basically, how many um, of each atom that we have in the compound. Okay, so the little blocks on the periodic table have information inside them. So for each block, we have the identity of the element. So for example, for hydrogen, the block tells us this is the symbol, the chemical symbol for hydrogen. Above or below it, we have what's called the um, mass for hydrogen. And above it, there's some more information that we'll talk about um, or review as we go forward. Remember, the chemical symbol doesn't always necessarily stand for an element that it sounds like. Many of the um, chemical names on the periodic table or the chemical symbols on the periodic table were, de were de derived from Latin. So, for example, something sodium has a chemical symbol of Na. Gold has a chemical symbol of Au. Silver has a chemical symbol of Ag. The most important 
elements that we're going to be looking at or, or seeing over and over and over again that you should memorize and commit to memory for the first um, chapter or so are carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, helium, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus, and fluorine. Um, you should refamiliarize yourself with um, with the names of the other chemical symbols as well, or the names of the other elements and their corresponding chemical symbols. But um, for the most part, these are the ones that we're going to be using the most extensively in 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 applying uh, chemical principles to life functions. Okay, so in a periodic table, I'm going to go back to where's my graphic for the periodic table. Okay. So within each group on the periodic table, we said that the up and down every column, we call that a group. And we've got numbers above each group that tell us what that group number is. So um, the group numbers that have a B next to them, we call transition metals. The groups that have an A next to them, we call the main group elements. Okay, so up and down in one of these periods or rows, each element that's in that, did I just say periods or rows? Yes, I did. Up and down in each group or family, each element in that group shares similar characteristics. And it's based on how its atoms are structured. And we're going to talk about that later. But everything in this group, behaves similarly. Everything in this group behaves similarly. The first two groups and the last two groups behave so similarly and have properties that are so important that they have special names that they've been given. So I'm going to erase this right quick and hurry. All right. So elements in group one are called the alkali metals. Elements in group two are called the alkaline earth metals. Elements in group seven are called the halogens. And elements in group eight are called the noble gases. So if you have are asked to look at two individual elements and determine whether or not they share similar characteristics, you can look at their location on the periodic table and determine whether or not they're in the same group or family. And then that, if they are, then you could, um, with good certainty, predict that they would have similar properties or characteristics. Okay. All right. So we've already talked about all of this. Okay. So we've already talked about um, Categories in characterizing matter. We've talked about what matter is composed of, um, composed of elements that um, <clears throat> that have atoms as their indivisible unit. And then we talked about that the fact that compounds can be built from individual elements. At this point in the presentation, I had to come back and insert this. This is. Um, a part of the presentation that I intended to cut out but cannot. So um, just recognize, please, that you can skip over about four minutes um, because I accidentally recorded this with no sound. So um, you can skip for a few minutes forward um, over this part of the presentation. The fact that you're hearing silence is not 
in error. So I'm not going to write them down. I'm going to read them.
from All right. All right. So the first question asks is what is x? What is the elemental symbol for oxygen? And that one is pretty easy. We know that it's O. To what group does oxygen belong? Oxygen, when we look at the periodic table, is in row six. I'm sorry, group six. I keep um, crossing up the terminology with group and row tonight. Um, to what group does oxygen belong? It is in group six, which means when we look at the periodic table, the number that is above the group that oxygen resides in is 6A. So it's in group six. To what period does oxygen belong? Well, let's go look at that case. I can't remember that one off the top of my head. I think it's in two. Hmm. So oxygen is here. It's in group two. I'm sorry, it's in group six and it's in period two. Period two. Group six. I skipped ahead to get to the clean sheet of. Okay. All right. So it's in period two. Identify and give the numbers of atoms, number of atoms in each element in the following compounds. You've got two carbons. You got four hydrogens. And you have two oxygens. Now, for those students who are taking this class that are chemistry majors, I know this, this should be painfully easy for you. This should be very painful. This is for the benefit of those who are non-chemistry majors and who haven't had um, extensive chemistry. Um, so this is something that you should already know how to do. Feel free to fast forward at any point in time. Um, but I want to make sure that we have um, everybody starting out for the next few chapters that are, I want everybody on level, on level ground when we start moving forward. Okay, classify the following as metals or non-metals. And to do this, we start going to where it's located on the periodic table. You know, that imaginary stair step line that I showed you. If it's to the right of that line, it's a non-metal. If it's to the left of that line, it is a metal, and if it sits on that line, it's a metal oid. So, sodium is way to the left of that line, so it's a metal. Potassium is a metal. Nickel is a metal. And the rest of these sit way to the right of that stair step line. So, chlorine would be a non metal. So would fluorine, and so would neon. Okay. So that's enough practice. So let's move forward. So we talked about how we can classify and identify matter, how we can write chemical formulas um, to represent the, the combination of two or more elements together. We talked about the periodic table and all of the information. We didn't talk about all the information, but the fact that we can um, obtain a lot of information about the properties of an atom of a certain element
basically this prefix tells us how many of the base unit that we have. It tells us the relationship to the base unit. So one sorry gigagram is equal to one billion grams. One megagram, you simply write the abbreviation of the prefix in front of the abbreviation for the base unit. So if we're talking about grams, it would be gigagram, megagram. So one megagram would be equal to a million grams. One kilogram would be equal to a thousand grams. And then you have your grams. It's a base unit. It has no prefix. Then if we start talking about a decigram, one decigram, when we're on this side now, we're not multiplying anymore, we're dividing. So one decigram is equal to one divided by 10, which is a tenth of a gram. One centigram is equal to one divided by 100 or 0 0.01 grams, etc., etc. Okay, so um, that's how we use our prefixes. And we can actually use these prefixes um, in terms of relationships to convert from one unit to another. And so notice that in this example, and like I say, this information is um, mostly for folks who are not chemistry majors. This is just a very, very, very basic refresher. You should be bored if you're a chemistry major right now. Okay, so we use gram as our base unit, but we could do exactly the same thing with, it would be a gigaliter, a megaliter, a kiloliter, a liter, a deciliter, a centiliter, if the base unit is liter, and if the base unit is meter, would have exactly the same prefix, but we would have a different base unit. A gigameter, a megameter, a kilometer, which is, or they call it internationally, a kilometer. Um, a decimeter and a centimeter, we're accustomed to seeing those um, more, <clears throat> more frequently. Okay, so now let's move on. So, just like I said, we can use them to convert between one unit and another. Your slide tells you that the quantities can be related to each other by an equal sign, and those quantities that can do that are called equivalent units. So just like I showed you up here, um, a decigram or a deciliter or a decimeter is equal to 0 0.1 gram. We can use that as a conversion factor. This is the same thing. One decigram is equal to 0 0.1 gram, or one gram is equal to 10 decigrams. So if we got one gram, that's equal to 10 decigrams. One decigram is equal to 0 0.1 grams. So sit there with that and practice it to look at those relationships if you haven't taken chemistry in a while. But basically, when we use these as a conversion factor, we can go from one quantity um, to another. And so I need to give you um, a couple of examples here. I apologize for my voice.
uh, an example of how we convert units. If we want to go from one unit to the other, for example, if I tell you that um, I have a 52 kilometer run that I'm going to do or a 5K, let's say a 5K run, a five kilometer or five kilometer run that I'm going to um, do and you want to determine um, how many meters that is. You would be able to um, use those prefixes to convert between units. And so the first thing you need to do is determine what unit you want in your final answer. The second thing you need to do is figure out what unit you've been given to start with. And then set your problem up and define or decide which conversion factor you need. And in some cases, you may have to go, um, um, you may have to use more than one conversion factor. It's up to you. So let's look at an example. Okay. So how many grams of vitamin C are in a tablet containing 100 milligrams of vitamin C. Okay, <clears throat> so the thing we need to do is first find the unit that we're starting with, what we're given. So we're given 100 milligrams. Then we find the unit that we want to end up in. We want to end up in grams. So our little formula told us that we start with the given unit and then we multiply that by a conversion factor that shows the relationship between the desired unit and the given unit. And this is a long way around explaining this. And if you work a couple of examples, it's going to become much more apparent for those of you who haven't had this before. Okay. So that way, we want to be able to cancel out our given unit. So in this case, our given unit is 100 milligrams. Okay. The desired unit that we want this in is grams. So now what we need to do is look at a relationship between milligrams and grams. So for every one gram, there are 1,000 milligrams. So we multiply this out, and when we do so, our units will cancel and we end up with our answer which is 0 0.1 grams. Let's look at another example. Let's look at a couple. Convert 10,000 centigrams to grams and convert 0 0.05 liters to milliliters. So once again, we're going to use the same strategy. You write down the units that we were given or the information that we're starting with. 
we're starting with 10,000 centigrams. We multiply this by what we call the conversion factor that allows us to put the desired unit in the numerator and the unit that we want to get rid of in the denominator. And now we look at the relationship. In one gram, there are 100 centigrams. So therefore, our final answer is 100 grams. We canceled out the unit that we wanted to get rid of. And our final answer is in the unit that we desire it to be in. The last example is to convert 0 0.005 liters to milliliters. We write down what we start with, 0 0.005 liters. We want this to be in milliliters. We want to get rid of liters. So the relationship between milliliters and liters is there a thousand milliliters in one liter. And so therefore, we're going to end up with an answer of five milliliters. That's how we convert between um, base units. Um, that's how we convert. Uh, quantities using our prefixes. Okay. So we figured out how to identify matter. Now we figured out how to use our prefixes to be able to look at the relative magnitudes um, of a measurement from very, very large to very, very small. And so now we have to look at. Uh oh what we call how significant something is, okay? If I got on a scale and I weigh is there something I need to say about or in the 145. This is the number right here, the number that we call a significant number. It's When we talk about And so, if I look at somebody in the mirror, or if I look at somebody, if I look at somebody in the crowd, I apologize. My brain is starting to shut down. I'm getting very tired. So let me refresh here. Let me let me get it together. So I look at somebody in the crowd, and I and my friend asks me, "How old do you think this person is?" I might be able to guess um, twenty or twenty-two. But the if I can guess that they're in their 20s, then this last number is not really significant. If I can guess that they're in their 30s, whether they're 31, 32, etc., that this is the only number that you would have. And so the numbers that really, really matter and that we can actually um, identify with certainty in our measurements are what we call um, significant figures. If it's a number that is not really, really certain, then we call it, it's not a significant number. Okay. So in our measurements, 
when we go, let me make sure I'm on the right slide. I'm not. Yes, I am. Okay. So, in our measurements, before I get into the definition of significant figures, let's look at the concept and see if we can um, kind of get a picture of the concept before we start looking at the text definition and the words. If I'm going to make a measurement, let's say I have a measuring device that measures in, this is a meter stick. Let's say it measures in centimeters. So if I have a centimeter ruler and my broad divisions are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Would I be able to report a measurement that I make using this ruler if there are no other gradations in this ruler that are any smaller? Would I be able to report that the measurement is 1.372761? No, absolutely not. So the fact that there's not a lot of accuracy that I can get. I can't really get a precise measurement. I can estimate it that it's probably, if I have a measurement that's right in here, I can probably estimate it to be, let's get closer to the number I actually wrote down. So if I have, you know, a number that's about a third of the way between one and two, I could probably say, okay, it's about 1.3, but there's no way I could actually go into a higher degree of specificity with that number. And so basically, we can call the measure of uncertainty in a, the amount or degree of uncertainty in a measurement can be reflected by um, what we call by observing the significant figure. So this is the last number that I can report for this measurement that has some certainty associated with it. All of this over here, there's absolutely the yeah, other numbers, sorry. This 3.7, whatever I had written down here, all of these numbers are definitely um, not, we can't be confident that those are certain um, in terms of this measurement. So let's look at the formal definition of significant figures. Um, it tells us just what I said a few minutes ago that measurement relies on the precision of the instruments that we use to take these measurements. Um, we need to report our calculated or measured answers reasonably. All measurements have some level of uncertainty. You can't just be specific and exact on every single thing, although we strive for that. OK, in any measurement, the significant figures are the digits with known certainty plus one digit that we can estimate the certainty of. So, for example, in this pro in this particular example that I just used. The one. Well, we know that that's a digit of known certainty because we know it's one point something. But. The other digit, that three, that's our estimated digit. So we have all of our numbers of known certainty. Then we have our estimated digit. And that is what we call the significant figures in a measurement. Like I say, there's always going to be some level of uncertainty. And when we report significant figures, we're able to reflect or represent that uncertainty and convey how much uncertainty we have um, based on the number of significant figures that we use. 
Okay, so um, let's look at rules for determining whether or not a number or a measurement or is significant. So in any measurement, this is a in any measurement, all non-zero numbers are significant. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, always significant. But zeros kind of sort of are the sticking point. The zeros will or will not be significant depending upon where they are in a number. If the last zero in a measurement is, is significant, then we need to add a decimal point to it. So if I have a measurement of 10, and 10 is um, a high level of certainty, if that's our last significant, then we need to put a decimal point behind it to indicate that it's significant. Okay, in very, very, very large numbers, let's say this would be the last significant number because zeros at the end of a number are not significant. Okay, so we've got the two basic rules, and then I'm going to show you rules for how to represent significant figures in mathematics operations. But before I do that, the one caveat here is that we can have um, exact numbers. So an exact number is never figured in when we look at a calculation based on significant figures. They have infinite numbers of significant figures. An example of that would be dozen. A dozen is an exact number. It's a, um, it's a chemical, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is a um, accounting item as they call it here. So that's exact and has an infinite number of significant figures. So. Um, we never use that or consider that in our calculation. The only quantities that we use to determine the significant figures of our measurement are those quantities that have actually been measured. So if I'm subtracting two numbers or multiplying two numbers, I'm not going to consider a counting unit or an exact number, one that is always what it is um, in my measurement, in my calculation. Okay. So here are the examples and the rules, a summary of the rules. Okay, so a digit is significant if it is, if it is not a zero. So an example, 41, 15.3, all of those are significant. A digit is significant if it is a zero and it happens to fall between two non-zero digits. So in this example, there are two significant figures. In this example, there are three significant figures. In this example, there are three significant figures because the zero happens to fall between two non-zero digits. In this one, we have four and that brings us to the next rule. So a zero at the end of the number that has a decimal point is significant. So this has two significant figures because there's a zero that has a decimal point at the end. And these zeros follow a decimal point. So therefore, they're significant as well. There are four significant figures in that number. Okay, on the other hand, a zero is not significant if it's at the beginning of a number with a decimal point. So these zeros are not significant.
So therefore, this number has one significant figure, and this one has two. Zeros are not significant if it's a very, very large number without a decimal point. Those are insignificant, and so is that one. So that's two significant figures in this one and three in this one. So basically, we said a few minutes ago that if it is a zero that is significant in a number like this, we put a bar over it. So if that bar was there, then we would have four significant figures. Or if the bar was somewhere else, then we would count up to that bar to represent our significant figures. Okay, so I guess we should look at a couple of examples. Well, we just did actually. That's enough of that, I guess. This kind of should, like I said, once again, this should be reviewed. Uh, and I'm going into more detail than I probably should to review this. But um, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. All right. So what about math operations when we use measurements? How can we determine the number of significant figures in a calculation that involves measurements? So when we add, subtract, multiply, or divide, we've got another set of rules. So if I started out with that um, 1.3 measurement a few minutes ago, and I happen to multiply it um, by a number that's, let's say, 2.000, I cannot end up with this and be able to report that figure to that level of certainty because it would imply that the relation, well, how do I put this? It would imply that um, that this measurement is more certain than it is. So we can't do that. So in order when we multiply and divide, we report our number based on the number that has the least number of significant figures. If we reported this number as 2.6000, it would say, oh, wow, that was a measurement that is really, really, really precise. But we can only report our final value um, with the number of significant digits of the number that's least significant. I hope that makes sense. So this is the way it's explained down here. For multiplication and division, the answer should be given to the least number of significant digits in the measured numbers. If I was multiplying this by, by 12, then we wouldn't consider 12 um, in terms of counting it. We would only count I know that doesn't make sense the way I just said that, okay. Remember, 12 is an exact number. So 12 would not factor into our consideration for which number to use in terms of uh, reflecting the significant dig digits or significant figures. So 1.3 is the only measured quantity, so it would be the only one that would factor in. For addition and subtraction, Answers should be given to the least number of decimal places in the measured numbers. So let's look at these rules at work. Um, and if the rules according to rounding up, um, when we do our examples, if the number to the left of the least significant if of the last um, number is four or less, then we remove it and the remaining digits. Okay, if the leftmost digit to be dropped is five or greater, then we basically round it. Okay. So all of that, we're gonna be able to look at in an example here. I am so apologetic for my voice and for my um, 
Hopefully I'm not confusing you. I'm getting extremely tired of talking. <laughs> so but that's not a problem. Let's keep rolling. So let's look at an example where we have addition of a number of some numbers. One point zero zero two. Two point five and two point six. Okay, so based on our rules, when we take the sum of this number, we end up with thirteen point six six two is our answer. But for addition and subtraction, our rule told us that we have to take the number um, that has the least number of decimal places. And so the number that has the least number of decimal places is one decimal place. And so if we were to report our answer with one decimal place, we would need to round that number up to 13.7. Okay. <clears throat> so let's look at another example. Okay, so when we take the sum of this number, we end up with 4.064. Okay, so the number that has the least number of decimal points is 1. So we need to report our number with the same number of decimal places to the right that this number has. And it doesn't have any decimal places to the right. So we need to report our number with no decimal places to the right. This number is zero, so we don't have to round. If this number had been 4.664, then we would report this number as five. But since it's four or less, we simply report it, and we simply drop the number, which is what the rules that I was trying to go through a few minutes ago, we're telling us. The leftmost number, if it's five, four or less, we drop it. If it's five or greater, we round it up. So basically, it's just like simple rounding rules. Okay. So in multiplication and division, we do something just a little bit different. For addition of subtraction, of course, we see here, we take the one with the least number of decimal places. For um, multiplication and division, we take the number with the least number of significant digits, period, and that answer should have that same number. So, looking at a quick example. So, let's say we're going to do two. Point zero zero times three point two. We end up with the number that's six point four. So the number in this measurement, if these are both measure quantities, the number that has the least number of significant digits is this one. So the answer should be reported, and it has two. The answer should be reported then to two significant digits, which is this number right here. Let's say. We've got 3,000 times 2.6, Trying to make these numbers numbers I can multiply easily in my head. And that, that's not about to happen. Let's make it um, 2.00. .00. 
All right. So the number that has the least number of significant digits is this one. And in order to report the number that we get to the correct number of significant digits, we simply can leave it like that. If we have a lot of numbers, we can do what we call scientific notation, which is where we use exponents to represent the number of decimal places that um, we need to move to get to our final answer. And we're gonna see that in one second, but one more example of multiplication and division. Um, 3,207 and two. So in this case, we would need to represent our number to one significant digit. So therefore, we'll write it like that. Okay. So I think that's enough examples. All right, so scientific notation, just like we were just saying a few seconds ago, this number right here is awfully long, the 600,000. We could actually very easily represent that number in scientific notation. The general form is a coefficient, which is the number that um, is between one and nine. And the N tells us the number of, of decimal places, number of tens places to apply. So in this case, we've got one, two, three, four, five. So the coefficient would be six. And then you would say times 10 to the fifth power. So that tells you how many times 10 that this is multiplied by. So basically that also just tells you the number of zeros that you have at the end of your uh, number in this case. But if it's the number, let's say, it tells you the number of 10 spaces that you move your decimal place. So in this case, if we wrote scientific notation, this number is 6.5237 times 10 to the fifth. That tells us that we would need to move our decimal place one, two, three, four, five times. So our number would look like that. If there's no number at the end that gives you enough spaces, you have to add a zero. Okay, so if n is positive, that means that the direction that you're going in is to the right. You're moving your 10 spaces to the right. If the n is negative, you're going to the left. So when we write scientific notation, the only numbers that appear in this coefficient are the numbers that are actually significant. So in this case, the one we just saw on the previous slide, it would simply just be six times 10 to the five, like I just said. So that's the only significant digit there. Let's look at what we would do for the other numbers we got in scientific notation. Okay, in this case, we would say 1.3, seven times 10 to the one, <clears throat> which tells us move our decimal place <coughs> so sorry. one time. Okay. <clears throat> In this case, we just leave it like that. And this one, it would be um, 6.4. Okay. And we already saw what would happen if you, uh, do this one. This one would be six times 10 to the three. Okay. 
And this is just um, a recap. What if we have um, a negative exponent? Let's say we've got one times 10 to the negative four. That means we have to take our one, assume the decimal places here and move four spaces. One, two, three, four. And place the new decimal point there. So that's what our um, <clears throat> expanded value will look like. So if you have a negative exponent, you move the decimal point to the opposite direction. If we have this number, then we would simply write that as if all of those values are significant, we need to write that as 2.5. 0, 02 times 10 to the negative 2. Remember, zeros before the decimal place are not, I mean, uh, yeah, before non zero numbers after a decimal point are not significant. Okay, so percentages are pretty straightforward. Percentages tells us. Um, the part out of 100 that something is. So whatever part we have, let's say we've got um, of, um, of course, of, of nine problems, of 10 problems on the exam, you got nine right times 100. So that's just 90%. And we can um, go backwards from percent by dividing by 100 and getting 0 0.9, in which case <clears throat> um, you can convert that to a decimal. Okay, so our definitions um, that define the stuff of chemistry. So mass is anything that takes up space. It can also be placed on a scale and weighed. It is a measure of the amount of material in an object. And we commonly use the gram to specify the amount of mass. Okay, so the weight of an object is determined by the pull of gravity on the object. And gravity de changes depending on where you are. But on Earth, it's 9.81. So our balances that we use in the lab um, have already been calibrated to take into account the amount of gravitational pull on Earth. So when we weigh our mass, it is equivalent to the weight of something on Earth. Volume is the amount of space occupied by matter. Um, we usually in the lab measure volume with a graduated cylinder or a pipette. For the most part, the um, standard unit of measure for volume is a liter. In the lab, most of the time, we report it as the, um, using the prefix of milla. So we usually measure most of our volume units, volume uh, measurements in milliliters. So if you're talking about in a healthcare setting, your volumes will be measured with calibrated syringes, syringes that have been um, specifically um, tweaked and um, calibrated to deliver a specific amount of volume to a high degree of certainty. In the clinical setting, um, you see a lot of times you see millimeter, I'm sorry, cubic centimeters or cc. A cubic centimeter is equal to a cc. A cc is also equal to a millimeter. So that means that these three things are equivalent. One cubic centimeter, one cc, and one milliliter all represent the same measure of volume. OK, 
Okay. When we talk about something's density, we're talking about its ratio of mass over volume. So how much does it weigh versus how much space it occupies? So basically, we always do keep this number in our mind that the density of water is one gram for every milliliter. When you think about the comparison between the density of different substances, um, think about uh, the density of lead versus, let's say, the density of a, of a sponge. Well, we know that if you put it in a um, container of water, lead would sink quickly, right? A sponge would probably float because it would be less dense than water. So basically for the same amount of volume, if we took these two different substances, lead's mass, which is in the numerator here, would be so much higher um, for a certain volume than let's say a piece of wood or a sponge or some other substance would. So therefore different densities of substances um, basically re relate to the amount of mass that they can that they have in a specific amount of volume and basically the text down here says just what I just said a piece of wood will float because it's less dense than water a piece of metal will sink because it's more dense than water um, density of a substance does never changes so the density of water is always one. The density of lead is always going to be what it is. Because it's simply, no matter how much mass you have, if you get a bigger, if you get a larger uh, mass, then the volume will correspondingly increase. So therefore, we can always use density as a conversion factor because the ratio of the mass of a volume is always going to be the same thing. If we take one gram of water, it will occupy one milliliter. If we take 100 grams of water, it will occupy 100 milliliters. So there's always going to be that ratio. We will always have um, that relationship. As one increases, so does the other proportionately. Temperature is the measure of a substance to determine its hotness or coldness. Um, we often use a temperature probe or a thermometer.